My name again is Christina Snyder, and I'm a member of the Dry Creek Rancheria Band of Pomal Indians and the Tribal Affairs Secretary for Governor Gavin Newsom and lead the Governor's Office of Tribal Affairs. I'm joining you today from the ancestral homelands of the Patwin peoples. The Governor's Office of Tribal Affairs informs the work of the administration by coordinating and uh, by coordinating and facilitating government-to-government -government communication and consultation with the 109 tribal governments in California, each of which have diverse needs and priorities, and many of which are situated in historically underserved areas for broadband and infrastructure. Because of the unique challenges of California tribal nations and their citizens, that they face in accessing sufficient broadband to meet the growing demands of a more internet-based society, economy, and community care network, apologize, the spotlight lighting keeps taking my notes away. Um, the office is also a member of the California Broadband Council on the state's broadband for all efforts to help inform their work as they pursue digital equity across California. The administration and the state's broadband for all program is committed to collaborating with tribal nations to address connectivity and digital equity needs in the tribal lands in Indian country. This has been the foundation of the Newsom administration's broadband for all uh, initiative. We worked closely with the Broadband Council to establish the state's California Tribal Broadband Connectivity Partnership Summit and the Tribal Broadband for All Roundtable last year, and we're working closely with CDT, CPUC, and other state agencies over this next year and beyond to ensure that the state's Broadband for All program and the state's digital equity plan are closely aligned, sensitive to, and developed in collaboration with sovereign tribal nations to address digital equity needs. With that in mind, I encourage you to engage freely with the state folks present and follow up as needed to better understand not only how your nation or community might benefit from the middle mile build out, but also to inform the state of how to properly, respectfully, and equitably engage with your tribal government to ensure we're fully living up to our commitment to work in a mutually collaborative and respectful manner with every tribe in the state. So thank you, and I look forward to hearing more about your needs and priorities as we go through this agenda, and I will hand it back. All right, thank you, Secretary Snyder. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am truly honored to be with you today talking about an essential topic, um, what is at the top of all, all of our minds, which is broadband for all. I am Leanna Bailey Crimmins, a director of the Department of Technology and also the chair of the Middle Mile Advisory Committee and the California Broadband Council. Just a reminder of a very sobering statistic. 28% of tribal lands do not have modern broadband services of 100 megabits per second. And millions of state residents lack connectivity, devices, and skills necessary to access essential services and realize social and economic benefits. Our goal is not only to provide connectivity, but also affordable connectivity. Broadband for All is Governor Gavin Newsom's commitment to closing the digital divide, and bringing internet services to unserved and underserved homes, businesses, community institutions, and tribal communities. In June 2021, Governor Gavin Newsom signed SB 156 into law. It was to construct an open access middle mile broadband network, which is a backbone of infrastructure that internet service, service providers will connect to in order to run connections to homes and businesses. CDT and our partners that you're going to hear from today uh, have worked at breakneck speeds to deliver many force first in, in, a, in a very short time frame. And the middle mile, so think about that June 2021, August 2021, which was very short thereafter, we held our first middle mile advisory committee. And then November 2021, we had 18 middle mile locations announced. And then June 2022, we had a full statewide network map published of the full 10,000 miles. And then good news, we're very excited. This past October, we installed the first middle mile of fiber in Poway, California, which is in San Diego County. The pace has not slowed. We have an entire system currently out uh, for bid to industry, and we are requesting and suggesting, you know, their suggestions on how to implement different methods to make sure that we're doing this um, in a cohesive and cost effective way. And in January this month, we expect to make construction and leasing decisions um, based on those proposals received. 
Besides updates on the middle mile, you are going to hear about um, our statewide digital equity planning effort um, from Scott Adams. And we're also going to uh, look at how our state can determine how best to use federal dollars to access affordable and adopt digital equity and, and adopt digital equity and inclusion across our entire program. We look forward to partnering with you and the tribal nations to ensure that the state's digital equity plan is built with tribal communities in mind. I'd like to go ahead and uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak and now turn the mic over and welcome Chief Deputy Director Michael Kiever from Caltrans. Uh, thank you, Director Bailey Crimmins and uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to join you. Uh, Director Tavares Caltrans uh, is traveling, uh, but he did ask that I send uh, his regards as well. And so my, my pleasure to join you here. I think Secretary Snyder and Director Bailey Crimmins uh, have uh, set the stage on, on you know, what um, the program is about. And so let me try to emphasize from the Caltrans side, our intent to engage with you, you know, high level diplomacy like we are doing here in, in this meeting uh, going forward, but supporting the California Department of Technology to build this backbone infrastructure and create the 10,000 middle mile uh, network. And so for Caltrans, our role, uh, we, are gonna, we are responsible for completing all of the project level environmental studies, the compliance documentation associated with that, and the design and construction around the state for the 10,000 miles. And so the, through our districts and our district coordinators, we'll be continuing our outreach to the uh, culturally affiliated tribes around the state for project level consultations. So some Tribal governments uh, on this may have already uh, had uh, outreach uh, from the districts along the lines of what Director Bailey Crimmins uh, is referring to as our projects are going forward, but certainly that will be uh, accelerating very ambitious schedule as she has laid out. Um, we do recognize that to get the best project solutions, it's only gonna happen by having strong tribal, regional, local local government relationships um, and, and maintaining those to get everybody's input, ideas, and resources, as Secretary Snyder uh, talked about. And so it'll be meetings like this, and then regular communication coordination with the uh, Caltrans uh, tribal relations staff to work collaboratively uh, together with you to address the needs of the tribal nations. While Caltrans is often looked at as a, a road and highway organization, ultimately we're about connecting people. And, and so we're very happy to engage with the Public Utilities Commission and CDT uh, and working with all of you on the Broadband Middle Mile Initiative uh, to make and connect people. So thank you very much. Again, I know your time is very valuable and we appreciate you being here. And with that, I will turn it over to Executive Director Peterson from PUC. Thank you very much, Chief Deputy Director Kiever, as well to Secretary Snyder and Director Bailey Crimmins for the invitation to join you today. And hello to all of the tribal representatives who are here as well. I'm very pleased also to be here in support of the partnership between the statewide Middle Mile Project and our last mile programs. We are working to bring this once in a generation funding to all of California to build the inf internet infrastructure. I am Rachel Peterson. I'm the executive director of the California Public Utilities Commission. Our agency's mission is to regulate utilities so that people across California have access to clean, affordable, reliable utility services. The CPUC has a broad portfolio in energy policy and regulation, in safety, in water and in transportation. And very importantly, later on this afternoon, I'll be talking about some of our communications programs. Those are our last mile and other programs that directly impact your lives in Indian country. 
And I thank you in advance for coming today to hear about these initiatives. Um, I feel, and I know uh, just about everyone feels that the pandemic ended the debate over whether broadband is a necessity and nowhere has that been more clear than where you are. With Senate Bill 156 in 2021 enacted by the legislature and the governor, um, alongside the middle mile investment came an investment of over 2.75 billion for last mile programs. These new programs have an emphasis on empowering tribes and local governments to solve the digital divide. We think that helping your initiatives and supporting your partnerships is critical to getting people connected in areas of California where traditional internet service providers won't go and where mobile coverage is also not of high quality. Our programs are designed to help get you there. And I hope that you'll be able to tune in later on for that last mile discussion. Thank you again for your time and I look forward to our continued work with you. Thank you. And thank you, Executive Director Peterson. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we are also joined by members of executive uh, leadership from the Caltrans districts covering the southern portion of the state. Um, so I am pleased to introduce a, a number of different folks. Um, we will uh, begin with Caltrans um, Deputy District Director of Environmental Analysis for District 7, uh, Ron Kaczynski. Um, we will have District 8 Director um, uh, Rebecca Guirado and District 11 Director Gustavo Dallarda, Di apologies to Gustavo, Gustavo Dallarda, and we will then go to um, District 12 Deputy District Director for Environmental Analysis, Chris Flynn. Ron? And good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's a really a pleasure to be here. I'm representing uh, Gloria Roberts, our District Director, who's uh, tied up with a lot of maintenance issues right now, as you can imagine. It's wonderful to uh, be involved and see everybody here. And uh, before I started working at Caltrans, I was working in the aerospace industry and working with some really wonderful people from the uh, Navajo Nation. And we would say it uh, at the morning when we said to each other, yate, it's the one thing I know in Navajo. So I thought I'd pass that on. Um, we need your assistance and as we collaborate uh, on these multiple projects in LA and Ventura County, and we're already uh, doing a lot of collaboration. We have uh, 644 miles of fiber optic conduit and cable that we want to install. That's going to really help with businesses and residents uh, in terms of virtual schooling, healthcare appointments, uh, job opportunities, and the various things that, uh, that, that the cable gives to, to people to uh, in, improve their lives. Uh, this is especially important in locations to our tribal partners and uh, we focused on uh, what we call equity routes, which are routes 91, 105, 110, and 710. Um, we've already had um, meetings with uh, various representatives of the Native Americans in the area. Uh, we first contacted the 22 Native tribes that uh, were, were involved in California here, and then um, we've already met with 11 tribal representatives and from and representing seven tribes, and we've been participating participating jointly with um, the representatives in terms of field investigations, working with our archaeological uh, team that we that we have on this. And we have a great archaeological group of people here in LA, incidentally, and um, so the field work and uh, surveys have uh, have been underway and will be completed this month. That's our option. Uh, that's our goal, and we believe we'll be making that. So we'll continue to consult with uh, with the tribal members that we're involved with here, and uh, go through the uh, through that consultation to the life of the projects until we successfully, jointly, successfully get this work done. Thank you for your time. Back to you. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thank you, Ron. And we will uh, continue with uh, District 8 Director Rebecca Guirado. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is again, Rebecca Guirado. I am the Acting Director for Caltrans District 8, which manages the department's efforts in San Bernardino and Riverside counties. 
District 8 plans to install 1,340 miles of fiber optic conduit to deliver high-speed internet services throughout our district in largely populated areas, as well as communities in remote mountain and desert regions to provide more equitable access to digital communication for the people and businesses of our two counties. Projects will be limited to a small footprint within existing transportation corridors and will be designed, excuse me, with the protection of natural and cultural resources as a priority. We have a long-standing and productive relationship with our tribal partners in the district, as well as government agencies, such as the Bureau of Land Management, US Forest Service, the Department of Defense, and State Lands Commission. Aided by these relationships, we endeavor to deliver these projects rapidly and efficiently. Our District 8 Cultural Studies staff and District Native American coordinators have been conducting project level consultations with local tribal cultural resource departments, including tribal historic preservation officers since March of 2022. And our project team will maintain this dialogue throughout the life of the projects. Consulting with you to ensure transparency and mutual understanding of our objectives and expectations. My staff and I are available to you should you have any questions or concerns. Please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you. Now I'll pass it to Gustavo, District 11. Thank you, Rebecca. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm the District 11 Director and District 11 covers San Diego and Imperial Counties. We have been tasked with delivering a little over 600 miles of broadband along our state highway system in those two counties. Uh, and in those two counties, we are coordinating with uh, 20 tribal governments uh, not all of the broadband is directly on tribal land. Of the 20 tribal governments, uh, about uh, four uh, might be lease lines, uh, and then six will uh, will have infrastructure uh, installed within tribal lands, uh, and the other 10 governments. Uh, will be benefiting uh, from the from the broadband as uh, most of the broadband is being deployed in the rural areas. Uh, the most important thing is the coordination, uh, like everybody's been mentioning. Uh, most of our broadband is on a project that was awarded uh, last Friday, uh, and, and uh, it's a part of a CMGC contract, which means we are hiring a contractor to help us design and the, the broadband in the most efficient way. So we'll be meeting with a contractor soon, trying to figure out where to start work first. As was mentioned earlier, we actually have a, another contract on State Route 67 in the, near the city of Poway, where uh, the broadband is already proceeding. Um, so please uh, feel free to reach out to us. I'm very curious to, to hear what kind of questions or concerns you might have. Uh, always our Native American liaison, Rafael Reyes, is available and a resource to you. Uh, he's here in, on this meeting. Uh, we also have other people from our team, including uh, Chris Schmidt, who's our district director of right away and also our regional broadband manager. Uh, and we also have April Lucese, uh, our program manager, and Levi Lee, our broadband uh, project manager. Um, and last but not least, Raj Preet Singh, who's the division chief of our TMC or Transportation Management Center that is overseeing all of the broadband in our district. Um, so again, uh, we have a lot of work uh, coming up, uh, some of it directly impacting some of your governments and, and, and lands, and we are uh, here to support you or answer any questions or concerns you might have. Uh, please don't hesitate to um, let us know. Thank you. I think, uh, thank you, Gustavo. This is Chris Flynn. I'm following you. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, I'm, uh, again, Chris Flynn. I'm representing Caltrans District 12. I'm very pleased to be with you here today and contributing to this broadband effort. I'm the de Deputy Director of the District 12 Division of Environmental Analysis, 
sitting in, in, sitting in for our District 12 Director, Ryan Chamberlain, today. My staff conduct tribal engagement for District 12, which unlike the other districts here today, District 12 only comprises one county, Orange County. District 12 has multiple broadband projects as part of this program, including projects on 11 state routes and uh, projects on Interstates 5, Interstate 405, and Interstate 605. In total, District 12 is planning on delivering 148 broadband miles in Orange County. Among our project portfolio, District 12 has MMBI initial project number 16, which will install broadband infrastructure on segments along state routes 22, 55, and 91. District 12 is finalizing its environmental compliance and final design for those segments and is targeting this current fiscal year for the release of uh, construction work orders along these segments. The rest of District 12's project portfolio is currently in the project approval and environmental document and final design phases and is targeting the end of fiscal year 2023-2024 for construction work order releases. So far, Native American consultation and coordination in District 12 was initiated for a State Route 91 project. The remainder of District 12's projects are currently working on determining their cultural resource requirements and will initiate appropriate Native American consultation once appropriate levels are established. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address all of you today. And like my, uh, my cohorts, we're very open to communication and collaboration and uh, would encourage you to reach out if there's anything we can help you with. Thank you very much. And back to you, Adriana. Thank you very much. I appreciate uh, and want to thank all of our opening speakers for their remarks and for joining us this morning. And um, if we can advance to the next slide. And as we do so, I just want to let folks know that we are recording today's session. Um, so just want to make sure that you are aware of, of that fact. Um, uh, with that, we will continue on with the agenda, and I will hand it over to um, Deputy Director Scott Adams with the California Department of Technology's Broadband and uh, Digital Literacy. Scott? Thank you, Adriana. Um, and uh, just want to say welcome to, to all the folks here. Um, it's an honor to um, share some information about the state's Broadband for All program with our uh, Travel Nation partners. Um, you know, very committed to um, working with you to help solve connectivity issues um, on tribal lands and, and Indian country, as Secretary Snyder said at the top of her comments. If you could advance to the next slide, please. Um, I think one of the things we really wanted to stress is, is noted in Secretary Snyder's comments that um, in today's increasingly um, uh, internet and technology dependent world, the ability to access and use broadband is the difference between being able to fully engage in life and being cut off. And as COVID uh, pandemic caught us, there was a, a huge inequities in the state as far as the digital divide and um, those were just exacerbated. So next slide, please. Broadband for all as, as had been mentioned by our, our previous leaders who spoke before is the governor's um, really coordinating and complementary effort to close the digital divide and, and foster the digital divide, um, you know, in the state of California and, and on tribal lands. And it's focused on uh, really four main components and that's uh, uh, access to both uh, infrastructure and internet service, increasing and, and fostering affordability of those service um, supporting adoption of service, and then um, creating and fostering digital literacy and inclusion so that um, folks can interact with um, this, this new ecosystem or expanded ecosystem uh, that's being expanded and created and, and actually leveraged with the federal funding. Next slide, please. As folks had mentioned, we, we just wanted to um, really create a context of the evolution of the Broadband for All uh, program. It really uh, began um, in 2010 with the creation of the California Broadband Council, which was the uh, it's the coordinated body that uh, has worked to promote broadband adoption and deployment throughout the state. Um, both um, the Department of Technology, um, Public Utilities Commission, and Caltrans, and the Office of the Travel Advisor are all members of that entity. Um, you know, the work was shifted and, and really um, redirected during the pandemic with the governor's executive order in 2020, um, which uh, ordered the development of a statewide broadband action plan, which was put together in about four months during the pandemic. 
and then um, really is as the previous speakers have mentioned Senate Bill 156, the historic legislation that allocated um, well over six billion dollars to um, develop the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative, which you're going to hear much more about um, later on today, and then the complementary last mile programs that the PUC will speak about. Um, you know, and really what I wanted to flag for you and the rest of, of my um, comments moving forward is that we are currently going to be leveraging additional federal funding in the um, programs outlined at the bottom to um, achieve the aims of broadband for all and are, are really eager to partner and align with um, your efforts. Next slide, please. So just wanted to center the, really the, the, the goals of Broadband for All were outlined in the, the Broadband for All Action Plan. And um, it's, it's, as Director Bailey Kremen said at the outset, it's wanting to make sure that, that um, residents on tribal lands and, and folks in the state of California have um, access to high performance broadband available at home schools, libraries, and businesses, that they have access to affordable broadband and the necessary devices to use the broadband. And then um, lastly, have access to the training and support that enables digital inclusion, not just to use it, but to advance educational and career and workforce opportunities and access to essential services. Next slide. Um, what we wanted to flag for you here, and there'll be other opportunities to engage, is that um, there are additional federal dollars that the state is leveraging through the Investment Infrastructure and Jobs Act. And, um, you know, it outlined about uh, $65 billion and allocated that to support broadband deployment and adoption um, in states around the nation um, and promote digital equity. The two real big pools that uh, the Department of Technology and PUC will be um, going after and leveraging are the, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program. It's about $42.45 billion. The state will get its allocation of that um, funding. And then the Digital Equity Capacity and Competitive Grants, which will bring um, a significant amount of, portion of funding to the state to support digital equity. Next slide, please. Um, what we wanted to flag for you here is that um, there is going to be an extensive um, planning process over the next year to develop the state's digital equity plan. And we are eager to partner and align with you. And um, part of that planning process will consist of a statewide planning group that um, Caltrans, the Public Utilities Commission, the Office of the Tribal um, advisor and, and about 22 other state agencies are part of, um, would love for you to participate in those. We are going to um, have established outcome area working groups around um, you know state policy priorities. There is a uh, tribal collaboration um, working group that we're looking to establish and would very much uh, want your participation in that. Um, we will be doing a, a number of statewide digital equity surveys and then um, hosting local uh, and regional outreach events throughout the state and um, wanted to provide a number of touch points where we can interact with um, your nations and, and um, you know, collaborate with uh, your needs um, and developing solutions um, collectively for your needs. And, um, and then lastly, uh, a number of statewide public engagement opportunities. Next slide, please. Uh, included in today's presentation is a link to uh, a page on the Broadband for All website where we hope that um, you can take some time and go to that and tell us how you and your tribal nation um, and, and interested parties would like to participate in the digital equity planning process. And um, that concludes my comments. I just wanted to, to really stress here that um, we collectively understand that um, there is a huge focus on broadband, both nationally and in the state, and that um, you know connectivity on tribal lands is a, is a huge focus on that. Um, we have shared with you already a lot of information, and there will be more information um, later on about these related and complementary programs. We just wanted to stress with you that we're um, very eager to partner and align with you on your efforts and provide assistance where needed to support 
broadband and digital equity needs of tribal nations and residents on tribal lands. So thank you very much. It was an honor to present to you today. Um, if we can advance the slides, and thank you, Scott, um, I would now like to hand it over um, to Mark Monroe, the Deputy Director for the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative with the California Department of Technology. Mark? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Scott, and, and thank you, um, thank you, everyone, all the participants. Uh, it's a uh, good afternoon and, and happy to be able to, to, uh, to talk through this project with you today. I'm Mark Monroe. I'm the Deputy Director for the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative, or the MMBI, here at CDT. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, as has been noted, the 2021 and 2022 budget uh, packages provided a total of $3.8 billion in primarily Federal American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA, uh, funds for uh, the Department of Technology to develop a statewide middle mile network along the state's highway system. Um, to connect the, the state's unserved and underserved communities. Uh, success of the, uh, of the MMBI uh, network uh, uh, depends heavily on Caltrans doing the pre-construction work, such as permitting and design, the construction contracting, as well as the project oversight. Um, based on a, on a robust, robust uh, public input process, uh, CDT worked with uh, Public Utilities Commission and the third party administrator Golden State Net to develop the map we see here, uh, which reflects um, MMBI uh, development along 10,000 miles of Caltrans uh, uh, freeways. Uh, and just to kind of a scale, that's two thirds of the 15,000 miles that Caltrans has. So uh, very uh, ambitious. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, want to draw attention to some of the challenges that we'll have. Obviously, with the 10,000 mile public works project, um, there are going to be um, some significant challenges. Um, one is that in terms of the $3.8 billion, well, that is, uh, is a lot of money uh, to most of us. Um, it is not expected to be enough to, to be able to actually uh, construct our, our own network for all 10,000 miles. And we're, we're still, we'll, we'll be talking through some of our efforts to make that money go as far as possible. Uh, but that does, uh, we're gonna have to look for some alternatives there. Uh, and then another, another key challenge is, um, as I noted, these are federal funds. And so um, the timeframes associated with the ARPA funding is not, not at all consistent with what Caltrans would normally um, do for, for transportation projects. All of these funds have to be under, con under contract by December of 2024, and the work has to be completed by December of 2026. So that is uh, four years from now that we have to have this, uh, this network developed, uh, built, leased, all the different pieces put together. Um, to, solve, uh, to solve for some of these challenges, uh, we anticipate um, uh, IRU leases of existing infrastructure will be needed. Um, in, in, uh, in certain cases, uh, and these opportunities are currently uh, being assessed uh, by, um, by CDT uh, to look at you know, availability and costs and such, um, uh, since it does remain our goal to reach all 10,000 miles. Uh, to meet the federal timeframes, uh, it was important uh, following completion of the map to, to have Caltrans begin um, pre-construction work on its, uh, its uh, permitting design work and such, uh, as much as early as possible, uh, which is why we, we worked to, to release the full 10,000 mile map this past May. Uh, we, uh, we have also been working with Caltrans to find ways to expedite its, its state and federal permitting efforts to again, help, uh, help th this project move, uh, move quickly uh, within those federal timeframes. The MMBI project is intended to connect unserved and underserved communities throughout the state, and we're, we're happy to have the opportunity to meet today to discuss the, the potential benefits of the MMBI project to, to California's uh, travel communities and to talk through the approaches to system uh, development, uh, in particular as they relate to the tribal lands. Uh, next slide. So. As, uh, as Mr. Gustavo from Caltrans uh, District 11 noted, uh, system construction um, has begun in San Diego County in Poway. This is uh, it's an example of, of uh, what we call early or early dig smart opportunities that Caltrans has been exploring, where uh, they're looking at how we can add fiber to existing uh, fiber infrastructure to existing transportation projects that have been planned. And, and not every case will work, but but um, we certainly appreciate Caltrans' effort in. Um, 
and looking for those opportunities. Um, more broadly, we want to talk through here um, briefly the uh, the pr primary construction approaches that we're using. Um, uh, for, for those who are used to dealing with Cal working with Caltrans, I think they normally use a, a design bid build approach uh, for most projects um, that um, can could be a very very effective tool. But um, it doesn't uh, necessarily lend itself to the speeds that um, and the expertise that we're looking for 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 a project of this magnitude. So um, the map here you see you can see the ten thousand miles and it reflects some um, uh, more than seven thousand miles of construction contracts that we're we're going to be talking through in a bit here. But uh, the the two primary methods we're looking at here is a, a CMGC or construction manager general contractor. And this is where. Uh, you know, as Caltrans designs it, they bring on a, a construction contractor to help them design it, uh, to do the permitting, pre-construction, all the work that um, to help facilitate uh, addressing any major challenges that we might encounter, um, any you know complicated segments, um, as well as uh, make sure that the project is going to um, go through permitting and design and construction as quickly as possible. And then the other uh, important tool that was provided for in uh, SB 156 was uh, job order contracting. Uh, and this uh, we this allows us to uh, to take uh, segments of the of the project or areas and go out for a, uh, broad um, con construction to get bids on in broad areas throughout the state. Um, when we look at this map, it's broken. It's not really visible here, but it's broken into five major um, regions, and this allows us to take major segments that are not anticipated to be terribly complicated and to get. To get cost estimates on them, and then as we move forward, we'll issue work authorizations against them. Uh, but it does uh, allow us to uh, to get a better understanding of what the um, uh, what's involved in building the network, and uh, and to get numbers earlier in terms of the costs to help us uh, refine uh, our our development of, of the network. And we'll talk a bit about network optimization uh, in a bit here. Um, next uh, next slide. So in terms of these contracts, um, the ones that we have out currently, you know, I've mentioned um, uh, IRU, IRU leases. These are uh, indefeasible rights of use. It's basically, you think of a 20-year lease. Um, and, and so we kind of own it for 20 years and um, we're able to, uh, it's considered a capital cost. And so we might, we're, we're looking at opportunities where we might need to, uh, to lease infrastructure that already exists. Um, similarly, we have uh, industry partners that are, uh, that either have already built or um, are planning to build. And we're looking for opportunities to do joint builds with them or to maybe purchase existing infrastructure. Um, and then lastly, uh, in terms of co-location of the electronics, uh, we are looking for uh, locations for that. So we, we went out for a bid in October for this um, and received bids um, uh, in um, at the end of December. So we're, we're in the process of looking through alternatives there, but. These are going to be important components relative to to filling out that ten thousand miles uh, and and making a network that's that's fully functioning um, within the limited funding that we have. And the second uh, the second uh, um, co contract solicitation we have out there is for, as I mentioned earlier, the job order contracts. That's fifty one hundred miles. Um, that's going to give us a a really good sense for. Um, how much we can, how much of this we're going to be able to afford to build, and to be able to allow us, as permitting and pre-construction work is done, to move forward with construction. And in the last segment there, I talked about CMGs, uh, CMGC contracts, and, and Caltrans has gone out for another um, roughly seventeen hundred miles of those. And so, with this, uh, we are making, uh, trying to move this project along as quickly as possible, um, because you know, as, as others have noted, uh, there's a real public need for this network and that that's an existing need that it, it exists right now. And we wanna make sure that we're able to, uh, uh, when it comes to education, to telework um, and uh, emergency service access, we wanna be able to provide that as soon as possible. Uh, next slide. So here you can see uh, what uh, Caltrans has identified in terms of uh, where the system goes uh, in Southern California relative to, uh, in particular to some of the tribal lands. Um, well, it is intended to connect communities. Uh, it doesn't necessarily go through all of them. Um, we want um, we want all of the state's travel communities to know where the network will be and how it can benefit uh, how it can benefit these communities um, uh, through a lot of the programs that um, that uh, Scott and others have talked about. Um, and shortly, Caltrans will walk us through its process in in working with the tribal communities and leadership in developing the project. 
Before we do that, let's uh, we can jump to one more slide here. Um, here you can see the, the schedule for the project that we, uh, we present this, updated versions of this at the quarterly um, Middle Mile Advisory Committee meetings, uh, MMAC meetings. Um, uh, we'll be having another one of these, I believe, on the 20th of January. Um, I mean, and we encourage uh, everyone here to attend these uh, these quarterly meetings. They're held virtually, so uh, you know we're broadly available to to anyone um, that is able to access that um, to really track the prog progress of this project. Uh, given this timeline here, you can see CDT will be working with Caltrans and Golden, Net, Golden State Net to optimize the network and and make key decisions based on the bids we uh, discussed uh, previously. Uh, that we've been receiving uh, to, to use the available funding as effectively as possible to bring middle mile connections to the state's uh, unserved and underserved communities. So with that, um, we'll open this up to, to any questions or I believe either Scott or myself. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And if folks have questions, um, please, um, if you would raise your hand and we will um, call on you. Um, so I'll pause for a moment. Um, let's see. Um, we have a hand from uh, Will uh, Will Micklin. Will, if you would like to unmute. Hi, uh, Will Micklin. I'm CEO for the Weepai Band of Kumeyaay Indians. Chairman Robert Pinto, Senior Vice Chairman Michael Garcia. We're a reservation in East San Diego County, uh, southeast of Mount Laguna, and a small section in Alpine. And uh, uh, my question is that in uh, Caltrans District 11 in the East County portion, there's not really a middle mile link there. There's I-8 that uh, is east-west in direction that um, is, I think, a redeployment of existing fire uh, fiber that's uh, under uh, resourced in, in that location. And then on the in the North County, so those are going over underserved locations. Uh, the the priority in um, in bead for Middle Mile is unserved uh, as a first priority and underserved communities. And I'm just wondering when there would be plans for East County that would look for a, a north south or actually um, from south to uh, uh, northwest link uh, that would serve that East County area that on the map is just a kind of a wide open area without middle mile. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, and I think it's, it's an important thing that, you know, that we should note that the, the state's middle mile network is, you know, given to the timing constraints and the funding constraints. It doesn't go to all the communities we'd like it to. Uh, we are limited to going along the, the, the state highway system. Um, that that's one limitation. So there is going to be you know, throughout the states, and I, you know, the, uh, throughout the state, a need to, um, it, to to consider some other. I would call it middle mile functions. Um, you know, to connect to bring some of the communities or to bring connections out to communities um, from the state highway network. So. Um, there, you know, there we can kind of look at the map, and you know, there's there's a number of communities, you know, as you're noting, where we would like to get to, uh, but given the time constraints, um, uh, you know, we we did our best to take the uh, the uh, the maps provided by CPUC and to be able to uh, you know to build out a network that we thought we could, um, we hope we can afford to build, um, and so that was those kind of based on this net, you know. This uh, the, the map that we have here is based on that, um, and and it admittedly does not does not go to every go out to every community. So there will be a need as we as we look at those last mile funding that is provided by the Public Utilities Commission. It's going to include some. Um, it's going to include some. Uh, uh, it's the, the need to, to to fund some of those um, sections that will go back from those communities and get back out to the state highway system where where the MMBI goes. So I thank you for the response. Obviously, we're constrained by available funding and time constraints. Um, I thank you for the 
uh, close consideration the state has given to uh, broadband deployment. Um, we we were just concerned because uh, uh, well, State Route One or Sunrise Highway would seem to be the the route for a uh, middle mile for unserved areas that are inaccurately depicted on the FCC national broadband map as served or or even underserved when they're not served at all. And um, we're, we're, our experience is if you don't get in the first round, then you get forgotten about in the subsequent rounds. And uh, so we're just um, trying to be the squeaky wheel and trying to get uh, some service that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also have a hand from uh, Steph Saavedra and apologies in advance on name mispronunciations. Um, Steph? Hatsi, um, I'm Steph Saavedra and I'm Nyonyo uh, Pueblo and Salagi and I'm actually assisting some of the tribes down here in San Diego. And I was curious to know, um, cause I still have a lot of questions and um, I was wondering how I would be able to get in contact with Gustavo so that I can um, have some of the questions answered. Um, is there going to be a contact list provided or? Yes. Um, so as we go through, so um, going through the agenda this, this afternoon, we're gonna be going to um, some uh, folks with Caltrans to first have a, a presentation on the project delivery. And then we're gonna be going to folks to talk about an environmental and cultural um, approach. And during that presentation, there will be links there to, um, to be able to reach the Native American liaisons um, in our districts, as well as some key staff um, within Caltrans headquarters. So we will be able, to, we will be providing that information. Um, and uh, we also um, have uh, noted, um, if you want to put, um, we have your information so we can note that for um, Gustavo as well. I believe he's um, still on, still on. Um, also on the call is April Lucchese with um, the District 11 and she is the broadband coordinator. So there's a number of folks from the district and we can help facilitate that. Okay, wonderful. And then will we be able to get a copy of this meeting since it's recording or the transcripts? I CDT is 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 our Zoom host, so I will um, defer to to Mark. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, my my understanding is this is I received a notice when I jumped on telling out telling us that this is being recorded. So um, I, I believe that's the case and it will be available. It's collateral that is um, both the presentation transcript and video will be available on the broadband for all portal past events page. Um, in addition, Adrian, before we move on, I would like to just do a friendly reminder that the raise your hand feature is in the reactions on the lower bar um, for those that do need to find it. Back to you, Adrian. Thank you, Cole. And I'm going to pause for just another few. Uh, little bit just to see if there's any other questions or hands. Okay, and if we can advance the slides, um, I would now like to hand it over uh, to the first of, of two Caltrans presentations. Um, this one will be from Janice Benton, the Assistant Deputy Director for the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative, and Hardeep Takar, who is the Program Director for the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative. Janice? Oh, Janice, I believe you're on mute. It's not a good meeting without that. Of course, yep. So of course I am, sorry about that. <clears throat> and thank you, Adriana. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Janice Benton. I am the Assistant Deputy Director over the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative for Caltrans. And joining me today is Hardeep Takar, um, the Program Director for the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative at Caltrans as well. Um, next slide. So it, it is a pleasure to be here to talk about the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative and the ambitious effort to promote the digital equity and inclusion. Today, we, it, it's about sharing the information about this opportunity 
and making sure you have the background on the Middle Nile Broadband Initiative. So we'll talk about what is this project, what's the type of work that we're doing, and how can you engage. <clears throat> this initiative is a significant undertaking, and as many of the speakers have mentioned, we'll need the partnership of all of our stakeholders and parties involved to, make, to meet this challenge. So next slide. And has been, and has, and as has been shared, the full system design map for the broadband middle mile initiative includes 10,000 miles of proposed build that spans across the entire state. And as Mark Monroe mentioned, to put this in perspective, Caltrans owns and operates about 15,000 miles. And so with this initiative, we are adding broadband to almost two thirds of our state highway system. Through this initiative, we are taking a comprehensive and long-term approach to tackling the broadband infrastructure deficiencies, connecting Californians and meeting the broadband infrastructure needs. So next slide. The Broadband Middle Mile Initiative, as, as Mr. Monroe shared, has an aggressive timeline to meet the network goal and to ensure we are maximizing the use of the federal dollars. So the federal dollars are provided through the Federal American Rescue Plan, which is Treasury Department funds, that requires the, the dollars to be encumbered by the end of December or be, by the end of 2024, and then all the projects closed out by the end of 2026. So that's our schedule, that's our milestones for these projects. <clears throat> We're working closely with the Department of Technology, who is the lead agency and project owner, to ensure we're prepared to navigate any of these challenges or potential issues. And now I will hand it over to Hardeep Takar, our program director, to share more details on how we plan to deliver the projects. Hardeep. Okay, uh, thank you, Janice. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I will be covering the details on the project development process and uh, how we plan to deliver these projects. Again, as Janice mentioned, my name is Hardeep Takar. I'm the program director for the Middle Mile Broadband Network Program for Caltrans. Uh, the Broadband Middle Mile Initiative is an example of how Caltrans is, uh, is not doing business as usual. Uh, we have been given the flexibility to accomplish this 10,000 mile goal and uh, next slide, please. Sorry, um, let me go back one slide, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in the standard project delivery process, which is linear with each phase being allocated and then completed prior to the beginning of the next phase, um, instead we are streamlining the delivery process to create efficiencies in design permitting and contracting, which allows these pre-construction processes to be completed concurrently with the goal to minimize project footprint and avoid and minimize impacts to environmental and cultural resources by staying engaged with the tribal um, regional governments to exercise avoidance and minimization measures during the project development process. Again, this will involve using construction methods uh, and means that I will cover in the next few slides. Next slide, please. To install the conduit and fiber optic table, the work will involve using plowing, trenching, and trenchless installation construction means and methods. Uh, typically, uh, four two-inch or three two-inch conduits will be installed in trenches that are six to 12 inches wide and 24 to 42 inches in depth, depending on the site conditions. Uh, standard details and plans and specifications have been developed for these items of work, including trenching on the roadside, trenching and pavement, shoulder and plowing, again, with the goal to minimize the footprint and the environmental impacts uh, from, from, from the proposed work. The work will also include building 21,000 volts every 2,500 feet approximately to pull fiber and building splice walls located every 15,000 feet during the network, uh, along the network, to serve as connection points to allow local access to broadband providers. Uh, we will also be building more than 200 concrete network hub shelters for fiber optic cable signal regeneration, which will be strategically positioned every 50 miles along the right of way where buried uh, fiber optic cable is transferred above ground to connect with devices to boost and enhance the data signals. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> In the next few slides, um, I'll be covering the description, typical applications and operations for the construction methods. 
Um, in, in, in this slide, uh, we'll be covering plowing, which involves using a vibratory plow to create a narrow slit in, in soil as the plow moves quickly, resulting in minimal soil disturbance and requiring an effortless cleanup following the operation. Uh, applications typically include areas where installation is required in a soil surface that includes an uneven wet dry terrain. Um, we have uh, in cases where we have a tight schedule, a long haul and, and will require restoration uh, following completion of the work. Next slide, please. Uh, traditional trenching is, is common for cross country installations and may affect traffic movement and is slower than plowing. Uh, trench and pavement will be allowed in narrow trenches on shoulder and pavement to overcome width and depth limitations encountered at locations where we need to avoid impacts to um, environmental resources and overcome uh, right-of-way restrictions. Next slide, please. This slide illustrates micro trenching. It's also a type of trench and pavement. Um, involves uh, cutting a narrow trench, typically three inches to six inches wide, and 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 depths up to twenty six inches. Um, cutting into asphalt or a concrete pavement, and trench depths below the upper layer uh, typically will be below the upper layer, but shallower than most utilities. And then operations will involve using vacuum excavation units to simultaneously remove the spoils generated from the operation. Again, this is primarily used for installing fiber. Next slide, please. Horizontal drilling applications may include long hauls over most terrains, uh, including rocky ground conditions, overpasses, embankments, side hills, and river crossings. Uh, operations will need to consider entrance and exit pits, pilot hole uh, or reaming and swab passes, a sound curtain for noise mitigation, and site restoration when work is uh, done as well. Next slide, please. This slide lists the typical equipment and materials used in the horizontal directional drilling operations. And next slide, please. For trenchless installation using jack and bore operations, uh, typical applications will include roadways and railroad crossings where a casing is required and where horizontal directional drilling is not feasible. Uh, similar to horizontal drilling, operations will need to consider entrance and exit pits, pilot hole or reaming and swab passes. Um, and pipe casing and site restoration when work is done as well. So this is very similar to the uh, horizontal drilling operations, except uh, that a casing will be required in these cases. Again, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to share the information on the project development process. Um, and at this time, I'll pass it back to Adriana and take any questions at this point. Thank you. If there are questions for um, Hardeep or, and or Janice, um, if you would please raise your hand um, and we will, we will open the floor. Just gonna give folks just another minute as you're looking for that uh, hand raising feature at the bottom in the reactions section. Okay, and I will just circle back. Um, Steph, I just want to let you know, I sent you an email with contact information. So um, if you do not receive that, please, please let me know. Um, and with that, I will, we will advance to the next slide. I will introduce um, Catherine Rose, um, the office chief for the Caltrans um, Headquarters Cultural Studies Office, and Sarah Allred, the statewide Native American coordinator with the Caltrans Headquarters Native American Cultural Studies branch. Catherine? Thanks, Adriana. Um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. As others have mentioned, we know your time is valuable, and we really appreciate joining us today. Um, as Adriana mentioned, my name is Catherine Rose. I'm the acting office chief for the cultural studies office. 
um, or CSO in Caltrans headquarters, Division of Environmental Analysis. Um, the Cultural Studies Office is responsible for developing, implementing, and monitoring cultural resource management for the department. And I'll let Sarah introduce herself. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Allred. I am the statewide Native American coordinator in Caltrans Headquarters Division of Environmental Analysis, Cultural Studies Office. I work on programs and policies related to Caltrans consultation with tribal governments regarding the effects of transportation, um, development on uh, cultural heritage and the environment. <clears throat> and I also administer the uh, Cultural Environmental Subcommittee to Caltrans Native American Advisory Committee. Um, it's great to be here today, and again, thank you all for taking the time. Uh, Catherine and I are going to share this presentation today to talk about uh, the cultural and environmental studies for the Middle Mile projects in the districts. And uh, I will turn it back over to Catherine for now, and I'll chime back in um, on this presentation a little bit later. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so can you, next slide, please? Thanks. So the earlier presentations provided an overview of broadband for all in California, what the middle mile broadband initiative is and Caltrans role in the project delivery process. So in this presentation, we are focusing on the environmental and cultural resources studies process and Caltrans consultation with tribes in that context. Um, the map you see here provides an overview of the 12 Caltrans districts relative to the statewide middle mile network and obviously tribal ancestral areas do not necessarily coincide with the district or political boundaries. So tribes may be working with one or more districts depending on your individual areas of concern. Um, each district is responsible for the design, environmental review, compliance, permitting, and construction of the middle mile broadband projects in their respective areas. And each district, sorry, each district has its own unique middle mile broadband delivery challenges depending on factors such as topography, the urban rural nature of the setting and types of environmental sensitivities. Next slide, please. Um, as mentioned earlier in presentations, the delivery of the middle mile broadband network is being accelerated. Design will be environmentally driven to promote avoidance of resources. So the early identification of sensitive cultural and environmental areas is a key objective in the design of these projects. Even though the delivery project process is being accelerated, Caltrans is still responsible for complying with all state and federal environmental laws and procedures, including the outreach and consultation with culturally affiliated California Native American tribes. The begin environmental milestone marks the point at which Caltrans formally initiates environmental studies for an individual project, including the initiation of outreach to culturally affiliated tribes. Caltrans will conduct outreach to both federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes. Um, and initial outreach efforts in the districts will be directed to tribal leadership and the tribes designated cultural environmental experts. And depending on ancestral territories, tribes should be receiving and or will receive communications from one or more districts seeking consultation regarding any cultural environmental concerns related to specific middle mile broadband project areas. Next slide, please. So each of the middle mile broadband projects in the districts will be assessed regarding their potential to affect the environment. And as is typical for Caltrans project, projects, cultural resource studies will follow a general sequence that involves the identification of sensitive resources and an evaluation of their significance in close consultation with the culturally affiliated tribes. So if significant tribal resources and or sensitive areas are identified within a project area, Caltrans environmental and design staff will work with the consulting tribes to avoid those areas to the fullest extent possible. The various design options that were presented earlier provide some insight into potential engineering solutions to avoiding and minimizing impacts to resources. And if there are circumstances in which the avoidance of a resource is not feasible, Caltrans consults with the tribes to minimize impacts and develop a suitable and appropriate mitigation plan that is reflective of the nature and scope of the impacts. So each project and circumstance is different and the nature of mitigation for an individual resource is based on consultation with the affected tribes. And as mentioned earlier, since the design of the middle mile broadband is environmentally led, 
the early identification of sensitive cultural and environmental areas is a key objective. This can be facilitated by good communication and coordination between tribes and Caltrans environmental staff. I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you. Next slide. All right. Um, thank you, Catherine. Um, so given that the design of the Middle Mile projects um, is being guided by early identification and avoidance of cultural and environmental resources, uh, we just wanted to call attention to some key information here that may be useful for communications and coordination with Caltrans staff about environmental concerns. Um, and first, uh, the Native American Cultural Studies branch webpage um, has uh, a variety of information for tribal governments, including a statewide contact list for uh, the district Native American coordinators, as well as the department's statewide tribal relations org chart. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so the Native American contact list, uh, Native American coordinator contact list uh, provides the most current points of contact for tribes in the districts um, regarding cultural and environmental issues. Um, we have had lots of staff changes and movement um, lately, so be sure to check the list regularly for updates. And in fact, I think there may have been a few changes since this uh, screenshot for this um, PowerPoint slide. So again, uh, just be sure to check, check that list for updates on the website. Um, many of the cultural and environmental experts uh, here today already have well-established relationships with their district Native American coordinators. But for those who are not familiar, uh, the district Native American coordinators can assist and guide you to the proper sources of information within the districts, uh, depending on the nature of the concern. And then as always, um, another point of contact includes those of us uh, in the headquarters cultural studies office and Native American cultural studies branch. So don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the Caltrans uh, tribal relations org chart also, um, uh, there's a link on the, the main um, uh, webpage. Um, this provides a broader overview of all designated tribal relations staff in the department, as well as Caltrans executive leadership, both at headquarters and in the districts. Uh, the district Native American coordinators and the district Native American liaisons in the planning program are the primary tribal relations staff and key points of contacts for tribes in the districts. And if there are broad issues uh, that need to be addressed um, beyond the staff level, we encourage tribal leaders uh, to seek diplomatic discussions and resolutions with Caltrans executive leadership as needed. And we can assist you with that as well as the uh, district Native American coordinators and liaisons. All right, next slide, please. Um, another very important resource is the Caltrans GIS Environmental Library. This is a straightforward, public-facing, interactive GIS map tool that allows you to view a variety of environmental and um, political layers for the entire state. Um, and the layers can be accessed via the tabs and sub-tabs shown here on the right-hand side of the slide. So you can easily um, you know, uh, check your layers and then zoom in to examine uh, your own unique areas of concern relative to other aspects of the environment. And among those uh, various layers that can be viewed is the planned 10,000 mile, middle mile broadband network um, shown here on the slide. Um, this GIS map tool will be a very valuable communication tool for tribal, cultural, and environmental experts in particular who are consulting uh, with the districts on the middle mile uh, broadband projects, um, particularly as it uh, you know, relates to efforts to avoid uh, resources through early identification um, and you know, the ability uh, to um, you know, assess areas of potential sensitivity. So if you haven't had an opportunity to visit this uh, GIS library, we encourage you to explore it for your specific areas of concern for the middle mile projects um, or any other projects within Caltrans for that matter. So don't hesitate to reach out to us if you need assistance using this uh, website. All right, next slide, please. Um, uh, lastly, um, as 
mentioned earlier, even though the middle mile uh, broadband projects are being expedited, Caltrans will comply, as always, with all state and federal environmental and historic preservation laws and policies and procedures. Um, and volume two of Caltrans standard environmental reference focuses on how Caltrans conduct, conducts its cultural resource studies, including procedures and expectation uh, for consultation with Native American tribes. Um, and as you can see, there are six chapters as well as a number of exhibits that accompany and complement each chapter. Um, so this is an excellent go-to resource for uh, gaining more familiarity with the overall cultural studies process. Um, and of course, we're here and available to answer any questions ab about that process. Um, if needed. Next slide, please. So, and on that note, um, we just wanted to leave you with some key contacts who can assist with any environmental or cultural resources inquiries related to the middle mile broadband uh, network delivery. Um, uh, if the people here are not able to answer your question immediately, they will certainly be able to assist you and point you in the right direction. Um, so with that, I would just like to thank you all again for taking the time to be here with us. Um, we hope this information is helpful and we're happy to take any questions, uh, hear your concerns and our comments um, regarding uh, Caltrans environmental reviews and delivery of the middle mile broadband projects in the districts. Thank you, Sarah and Catherine. Um, I will pause and uh, we will open the floor for any comments or questions that folks might have if you want to raise your hand. Um, and Will, um, I see you um, have your hand up. Thank you um, for tolerating me again. Uh, will Micklin, CEO, We Pipe Band Community Indians, Robert uh, Pinto, Senior Chair. Um, so be, because um, these uh, deployment projects are in already disturbed rights of way, it's likely that any uh, cultural related events will be in inadvertent discoveries. And due to time constraints and funding limitations, it would, it would seem reasonable that there could be a in essence, uh, like an HPTP developed that would be uniform. Um, the individual complexities, I think, will give way to uniformity because that these are likely already disturbed and it's the inadvertent discoveries of TCP that maybe um, would, would arise. So I, I think that's an opportunity. Actually, my two questions are that I'll, I'll beg for your indulgence. One is, um, in with this build out of middle mile, tribes are going to need to access that for the backhaul to their communities. It would be helpful since these issues probably lie with the same officials uh, with the state and Caltrans uh, that there could be um, further cooperation developed for the environmental and cultural issues that arise for a tribe's access of the middle mile uh, for backhaul to their communities, because likely what would be um, um, involved is a um, concurrent uh, CEQA NEPA, because most tribes have a NEPA implication for their off-reservation projects that then run onto the um, state lands for a CEQA uh, implication. So those are always difficult and coordinating with tribes in this matter because some of the federal uh, departments have not proven to be helpful very much in the near term with these issues of environmental and permitting and cultural. Um, and um, so I, I think that would be helpful. My, my second inquiry is again, uh, the same officials are likely involved in the FAST 41 uh, projects, uh, which are have a threshold of $100 million. We've asked our federal partners to include tribal projects in the aggregate 
uh, to reach that $100 million threshold so we could enjoy some of the expedited um, treatment of projects under FAST 41 um, that tribes would not qualify for because of that, that high threshold. Um, and it would be helpful if our state partners could um, support that as well. So thank you, appreciate it. And thank you, Will. And um, truthfully, we really appreciate the questions. Um, so I, I thank you um, for asking them. Um, with that, I know you had questions about the kind of that last mile connection. Um, that is, uh, we are going to be having um, actually after this Q&A section, we can have a brief break and then we are going to hear presentations on the last mile. So um, I would defer to, to those folks to be able to, in that presentation, to be able to better address some of those last mile um, conversations and, um, and kind of that, uh, the funding, um, funding piece um, with last mile. Um, and let's see, any other hands or questions? Sorry, Adriana, do we want to, um, well, I know that you had kind of your first question. I don't know if you want to. Uh, if, yeah, uh, Catherine, if you want to. Just respond. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, and and yeah. yeah, well, I also echo what Adriana said and appreciate your questions. So definitely um, keep asking them. <laughs> um, and just in reference to your first comment, um, I think, like we were saying in the, the presentation, you know, we're still responsible for um, complying with all the state and federal laws. So, um, and, you know, there is an expedited component to these projects, but we are still going, going to be doing our identification evaluation and all that. So um, I do, you know, the idea of a, a kind of store property treatment plan that covers all those, or, um, you know, we can definitely look into some options like that, that would help um, with, you know, the, the kind of the speedy process of these projects, but we're still gonna be following the laws. So, and Sarah, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add to that. Um, I, I would just chime in to say, um, yeah, intuitively one might expect that it's all disturbed and, you know, so, um, you know, there, it may not be as much of an issue, but, you know, over the years, we found that um, you know highways have gone through many cultural sites and exist, you know, on either side and underneath roadways and pose complications when any ground ground disturbance is occurring. And so, um, you know, we will continue, uh, you know, as Catherine said, to go through our cultural identification process um, to address those resources that. Um, occur within the roadway, whether they are known in advance, because many, many um, resources that span our roadways, um, you know, we're aware that they exist and, and have, you know, you know, take uh, precautionary measures when working in those areas. And then, of course, there, you know, are always um, unexpected occurrences. And, and, you know, we address those according to our um, historic preservation, identification, evaluation, and, um, you know, uh, avoidance and mitigation uh, procedures. Hopefully that helps, but let us know if you need clarification on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, if we can advance to the next slide and we're gonna take a five minute break um, I have 2.23 on, on my clock, um, so we will pause and return at um, 2.28. Um, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Um, it looks like we are at a little bit past 2.28. Um, we are at 2.29 now, um, so we will uh, move forward. Uh, into the next uh, the next couple or the next presentation. Um, so I will um, introduce again um, the executive director for the California Public Utilities uh, Commission, Rachel Peterson, 
and Matt Rantanen with the Senior Advisor for the Golden State Network. Um, and they will be um, focusing in on last on the last mile, that connection from the um, middle mile to folks, um, getting that in the broadband into folks, folks's uh, home. Um, Rachel? Thank you, Adriana. Uh, can I go straight to the next slide, please? All right, here's our overview. Um, hello again, everybody. Here's the overview for what we will be talking about. I'm very pleased to be here today with our tribal advisor at the CPUC, Kenneth Holbrook. He'll speak first from a broader perspective about the range of tribal work that's going on at the CPUC. Then I'll take the mic back and I will talk about the five programs that you see listed there which are the CPUC programs that are key pieces connecting last mile broadband projects. Um, and then we have um, Karen Eckersley on today's uh, event in the background. She is always available uh, to be reached out to for questions as is Ken Holbrook. And we've got our staff email sprinkled throughout the presentation for all broadband questions. It is statewide broadband at cpuc.ca.gov. So please feel free to reach out if there's something um, that you think of tomorrow or going forward. Okay, next slide please. And can I ask Ken to step up to the mic? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Rachel. Um, I'm Ken Holbrook, I'm the CPUC Tribal Advisor. Uh, my contact information is here on the slide for you. Uh, and I'm uh, really pleased to be with you today. I, I hope the impacts of the winter storms uh, are, are not too uh, terrible where you are today. Uh, this resource slide gives you the links to our tribal advisor and our tribal liaison, uh, liaison's office. Our consultation policy has been in place since 2018, and it provides a framework for all our divisions to establish and maintain effective relationships with tribes while respecting sovereignty. Our tribal office works to provide tribes with information about our programs. We consult with tribes on the development of policies and work to improve relations among tribal governments and the CPUC. The tribal land transfer policy allows for the transfer of land from investor-owned utilities to Native American tribes uh, that have uh, ancestral territory uh, where the site is located. Uh, when a utility- uh, Sorry, Ken, it's Rachel. Could we advance the slide, please? That's where the resources are that you're speaking about. There you go, thank you. Thanks. Uh, so uh, getting back to the tribal land transfer policy, when a utility begins the process of, of transferring land or selling land, uh, the policy creates an expectation that the utility will work with the California Native American Heritage Commission uh, to identify uh, any tribes whose ancestral territory uh, the land is on or adjacent to uh, each, you know, a, 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 a transaction that they're, they're working with. Once a utility identifies uh, an interested tribe or, or perhaps more than one tribe, uh, the company is expected to negotiate a transfer uh, to the tribe uh, by putting, uh, before putting the land on an open market. This policy, which CPUC developed um, after comment from utilities and tribes, furthers the CPUC's goals of recognizing and respecting native sovereignty and of returning tribal lands to their rightful owners. We have an open proceeding now establishing these guidelines and to revise uh, guidelines that have been in place for the past year. Uh, and many of you are participating in this proceeding uh, if you haven't already joined uh, consultations that we've done in the past uh, and in future workshops that are still going to come. Uh, we, we certainly encourage you to, to join those proceedings. Uh, and again, uh, you can reach out to me at uh, tribaladvisor at cpuc.ca.gov. Uh, for in, more information about that proceeding or any of the rest of the work that we do or any of the topics that you'll hear uh, Karen and Rachel discuss today. Um, and with that, Rachel, back to you. Great, thank you, Ken. And can we advance to the next slide, please? Okay, so um, we wanted to show uh, something of an overview of all the different programs that we have that are related to improving access to communications infrastructure. But not to worry, I'm not gonna speak about all of these today. We'll be focusing on the five that are highlighted in the yellow and peach colors. We just wanted to um, give this to you as to show you um, the extent of the programs that are available. Okay, next slide, please. The first one I will talk about is our Tribal Technical Assistance Program. 
Now we have been, we're kind of constantly on a listening tour around California. And what we have heard in countless public hearings and workshops and consultations is the problem of capacity within a tribal organization to work on communications issues. Sometimes there just aren't enough people or time to perform the research or the study work that tribes need for such technically complex projects. And so we designed our grant program with that in mind. It is for you tribal leaders and tribal staff to hire consultants to help you answer questions about your next steps in improving communications. This program has assisted 40 tribes with over 60 projects to date. We have very broad eligibility for this fund. It is inclusive of California tribes with or without federal recognition. And the grants are for up to 150,000 per year. We take applications four times a year, as you can see. And there's a link to our tribal technical assistance program page in this deck. All right, next slide, please. Next form of technical assistance is called local agency technical assistance. People do often say LATA, uh, but um, I'm gonna avoid acronyms. So the broadband package gave the CPUC the task of awarding $50 million in technical assistance grants to entities to help them prepare to provide broadband service in their communities. It's a kind of groundwork laying intentional grant. Public entities are broadly eligible, including tribes, cities, and counties. Individual grants are up to 1 million per applicant. And if uh, the request is for 500,000 or less, there's actually an expedited staff approval process. Tribes have a set aside of 5 million within this larger pot, and there is about 3 million left. Um, we've listed some of the examples of the types of pre-project costs that can be funded um, by this program. And um, so far we have had 94 applicants. We are still set, um, accepting applications. We are also seeking additional funds to add to the funds, but please um, consider preparing and um, submitting your application. Linked at the bottom of the slide are our county dashboard for a county by county view of the proposals and the um, actual grants to date. And then the technical assistance program webpage is linked as well so you can find more information there. We actually have applications from four tribes total so far. Tomorrow, the commission is voting at its January 12th voting meeting on an assistance grant for the Yurok tribe. And then um, Uyapay, Uyapay, uh, Hoopa Valley Public Utilities District and the Southern Tribal Chairman's Association all have put in applications that our staff is reviewing right now. All right, next slide, please. Okay, this is the important one. This is the last mile federal funding account. It is our largest infrastructure funding account. It will provide $2 billion in grants for last mile broadband infrastructure projects that will connect unserved people and areas in California. This is a significant investment and to distribute it fairly and effectively, we at the CPUC have designed what we call priority areas. Our goal is to use those priority areas um, to ensure that we distribute the program funds effectively and equitably. These areas are geographically defined and they are presumed eligible under the federal, federal funding accounts. So we try to accomplish a certain amount of technical groundwork in order to set standards and accomplish um, some of the, the work to meet everyone who's going to be applying for last mile funding closer to where you are. So many of these areas are in or near tribal lands and we strongly encourage you to look at the priority areas map and consider preparing your application. Each one is designed to support a sustainable business case for applicants 
and it's based on network engineering and modeling. They're developed with, these maps are developed with the most granular data that was available at the time when the program's rules were adopted. And our staff is continuing to update the maps as new data becomes available. We've linked the priority areas map. It is publicly available, so feel free to visit it. Uh, find your um, tribal area, see what is close by, and use that to communicate with us and start working on your application. Next slide, please. The California Advanced Services Fund is a fund that um, the CPUC has been managing for a decade. Um, it is funded by a surcharge on telephone bills and has up to 150 million per year in order to make a series of possible grants and investments. Since 2008, the program has awarded $327 million around the state in grants for 102 projects. There are adoption and digital equity grants, which are funds to um, ensure that organizations can help people connect to, understand and use the internet. There are public housing and low-income communities grants, which provide free connections to low-income households. There is a consortia account, which funds regional broadband consortia who are experts who help service providers and communities access grants. And then last, there are infrastructure grants, which pay for infrastructure in areas without access. All right, next slide, please. And then the last account I'm gonna speak about is called the Loan Loss Reserve Program. This is a program that will assist local governments and nonprofits in securing financing so that they can build out their own last mile infrastructure. It essentially provides collateral to enable better borrowing rates and terms for the bonds that will likely need to be issued to deploy broadband. So this is one that is still midstream. We're working on the program structure and the program rules. And our next step for it is um, we are taking in comments that have been received on a proposal and the commission will likely act later this year on solidifying those program rules. All right, I think last slide. And that concludes my formal remarks. We are here for questions after Matt speaks. Um, I love this photo. This is a photo of one of our California Advanced Services Fund grantees with their service provider partners. Um, these are representatives from the Hoopa Valley Public Utilities District and Hunter Fiber Communications. Uh, the reason I love it is because it is the people who are implementing broadband and they're in the guts of a building somewhere where uh, broadband is emanating from. So it's kind of that people connecting direct, very directly to that infrastructure that forms the basis of the modern California that we all know that we um, want to move towards. So once again, statewide broadband at cpuc.ca.gov, tribal advisor at cpuc.ca.gov, and thank you very much. I'll turn it over to Matt. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome everyone. Matthew Rantanen, um, I'm Cree from Treaty 6 in Alberta, Canada. Family's been in the US for 129 years. Uh, been a California resident for 31 of those years. And uh, I am a senior advisor for the Tribal Broadband for Golden State Network, which is a part of Scenic. Um, advising the California Department of Technology on this giant middle mile build. And uh, I have been the Director of Technology for Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association for the last 21 years. So I have a lot of experience here in SoCal uh, with, with a lot of the tribes. And um, my current role, uh, as I am on loan technically from SCTCA to this effort, is to support Golden State Network in advising the California Department of Technology in the development and uh, work that that is this California middle mile broadband network and what that means to each individual tribe. So um, I'm going to try to bring together uh, so a lot of the things that have been talked about today by CDT as well as CPUC, the middle mile, the last mile, and just kind of give you 
just you know just a little bit of uh information to, to think about and then a, a bit of outreach so um you know you have this giant middle mile network that that we've been talking about 10,000 miles roughly 10,000 miles of network um you know it's it's roughly 4 billion dollars of of funding and um you know it sounds like a lot of money and it sounds like a lot of miles but uh as we heard from Mr. Micklin um and thank you for your comments you know we're not reaching all of the tribes we're not reaching all of the locations in California and uh what we are doing is building a a very big foundational effort to reach as much as we can with this funding that we have um to be able to build from in the future uh we are doing our best to catch everybody that we can in this round but obviously we're not going to get everywhere we are however building a foundational network that will support every broadband effort that the California state um you know departments put forth moving forward so we're very excited that this is uh this foundational piece is being laid down uh you know as we see the funding flowing from from the federal government to tribes from some of the state programs to tribes um you know there is a lot to manage right now we understand that that tribes are inundated with opportunity and and choices to make in your communications future and so um you know we understand there's a bit going on today you've gotten a load of information uh the slides will be available I think this is being recorded so you get access to it to rewind and and refresh your memory and we're all available um to communicate with anyone at any time to be able to support your needs so uh my email is listed here and I would like to say that if you have not heard from me or somebody at Golden State Network yet about what this middle mile project looks like in relation to where your tribe is located uh, please reach out to me and let's set up a time where we can walk through um, some of those solutions and some of those opportunities that your tribe has um I will just say that um you know it's nice to hear all of the different pieces the different levels of information that are going on and I just wanted to say that regional tribal organizations and individual tribes working with their regional governmental organizations like SANDAG has with SCTCA we you know we have applied in that arena um you know SCTCA has applied for funding to actually look at a project uh called the Tribal Digital Village Network that's been in place since 2001 um and serving tribal communities in Southern California for you know for uh you know 21 years now um it's looking at a refresh and an opportunity to take that existing network and look at this middle mile infrastructure being built and integrate what exists in that network today but the middle mile efforts that are being built to enhance that network to improve speeds to improve quality of service to to reach some of those places that haven't been reached yet as well as to um you know increase the amount of throughput and match today's broadband speeds and tomorrow's broadband speeds so there are great opportunities that the state is trying to align with you to be able to plan and engineer um you know solutions moving forward and I will say as the um, NTIA at the federal government will be releasing um the the next round of of funding um I don't know if it's out yet but it's it was proposed to be the NOFA was supposed to drop in uh, January if it hasn't yet it's coming so you know it's time to have a plan uh to be able to apply for funding as it shows up in front of you already have a an idea of what your tribe needs already have a solution Thanks. at least on there. Here, so. uh, I want to thank everyone uh for their time today I know this is a long meeting and uh I turn it back to our question and answer period but please uh take down my email address and um and reach out to me and set up a meeting if you haven't talked to me yet thank you Um, so we are uh, again opening up for additional questions um, and to be able to answer um, and provide additional information. Um, so just pausing and I will give folks a few minutes to um, raise their hands, whether it's questions from this section and if, if there are things that have a, you know questions that you have from earlier presentations please um we would be happy to um to address those and um just 
continue. Um, you know, we have started the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative, started off as, as you know, this partnership between um, the California Department of Technology, uh, Public Utilities Commission, the Cal to Caltrans, um, and working together to navigate this effort from CDT and CPUC working to develop those maps and determine where we're gonna, um, with the design of the network um, to Caltrans coming in, to doing that, the construction piece and put, installing the fiber and conduit. We, we definitely appreciate the partnership. Um, and we look forward to continuing to engage and work with, with folks. Um, I am not, let's see. So I do see a question in the Q and A. Um, and I know this feature is working for, um, some of the folks have said they haven't seen the Q&A feature um, functioning, so that's why we've focused primarily on um, hands raised, but the question in the Q&A is what does the approval process look like for um, the LATA grants above 500000 Hi, this is Rachel. Thank you for that question. I'll start and then I'll likely ask Karen Eckersley to jump in and help me out. Um, so when it's above 500,000, essentially what we, um, we need to do is ensure that our commissioners review it and that it's put, so that it's put for a vote in front of them. And so that typically adds some process in order to comport with rules about um, due process. So that takes a little bit longer, goes through a vote, um, and is uh, just kind of uh, a little bit longer process. Karen, is there anything you would add? Um, our methodology for doing that is called a resolution. And, um, and I just have to emphasize that it takes a little bit longer. However, generally how we advise is if, you, if you're gonna take a big bite at the apple, take the time and, and go that way. Yes, if the budget is worth it at uh, above 500,000, then that extra process is likely worth it as well. And our staff would um, work with you along the way. Thank you. Um, perfect, thank you. And um, Will, I again, I wanna thank you for your engagement. I, I can't express, um, I really do appreciate it. And I, you have your hand up, so I would love to, to get your next question. Oh. And and you lowered your hand. Uh, that's, I just lowered it because I forget to lower it later. Got it. So thank you, and I want to. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Matt Rintanen for his um, exemplary work on behalf of tribes, uh, and of course through SCTC. And and Matt well knows the challenges of we pipe and the uh, other tribes, Manzanita, La Posta, and Campo in East San Diego County. Um, and others as well. Um, so my, you know, among those challenges, the, uh, the FCC National Broadband Map continues to show us as served, even though we're unserved. In fact, at and told us we're, they haven't even filed, we're an unfiled territory. Um, and, um, but, so the burden is on us to um, uh, justify a, a project for, a broadband deployment, and it uh, is a high cost for low uh, low tribal populations in the area. But if there was a solution, like bringing fiber up sunrise and being able to backhaul in the last mile from I-8 and, and S-1 from Mount Laguna, it would be able to light up not just us, but La Posta, Manzanita, um, and uh, maybe Campo, if Campo's, uh, I think Campo already has their solution, um, but reduce the cost significantly and make it uh, the, the project sustainable over the long haul. I get, my question is whether, uh, uh, and as well the, the uh, CPUC priority areas uh, over, uh, depicts over half uh, the Wee Pipe uh, reservation as a, non-priority area, you know, those are just things that we have to uh, resolve, push back and resolve. My, my real question is, if there's a way that the state can um, 
somehow collaborate in projects to offset some of the costs so that the small rural remote tribes with the highest cost, um, not just overall, but per capita, uh, that would bear the, the total cost of the project to make those projects more feasible. Um, where we are you know, proposing co-locating electrical conductor with fiber to electrify the reservation as well as a way to offset that cost. But it's really hard in with funding, government funding to have one program shoulder a percentage, a portion of the burden of a different uh, department who has a different ter territory to defend. So I just wondering if you all had thought about that, if there's a way to bear some of the costs so it's not a wholly state project, but not a wholly tribal project. And I don't know if the two mix at all. I'm just looking for solutions. So thank you. Um, I'll just so take that. I'll um, do a first okay, response. Sorry, okay, thanks, Karen. And then I'll turn to you. I'll just do a first response. You know, um, we're acutely um, aware of impacts of affordability on all, all manner of utilities. And so we're kind of constantly working to find different revenue streams. Um, well, uh, I'll ask Karen her thoughts on your, your thoughts. Um, you know, we do sometimes face constraints, but nevertheless, it would, if there are opportunities, I'm sure we'd pursue them. Karen, do you want to add? Yeah, thank you for your comments, uh, Will. Uh, as you know, it takes a PhD to figure out which rules fit with which money and, and trying to put them together um, adds a, a particular amount of, of complication. And uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry many things are that way. Um, when we develop the uh, priority areas, um, it, it wasn't the everything areas. Um, and, and they were specifically according to our criteria on prioritization, but, but we well know that they don't cover all of the uh, available need. So the methodology that we have is to be able to use uh, later tranches of funding, whether that be BEAD or for some of our other programs, to be able to start to uh, address some of the areas that we did not initially propose in those. So, um, and I think particularly um, the kind of engagement that you've had to be able to combine uh, projects together will, uh, will bear some fruit somewhere. Um, and we'd like to continue to, to work with you and figure out how that's going to come together. Thanks, Karen. And I just wanted to say thanks for the kind words. Uh, well, I appreciate it. Um, there are some solutions being devised in Southern California, and that SANDAG SETCA application is one of those um, that is specifically looking at solutions where connectivity is not the greatest in that network. So. Um, we should take it offline and, and I'll get you re-engaged. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Um, so, um, so I we have uh, another Q&A question and I think there are some additional last mile questions that are being posed with questions um, with regards to the grant and funding opportunities. So um, I know um, so um, just want to make sure that folks noted different contacts um, over at CPUC as well as um, at GS, uh, GSN. Um, so with that, one of the questions is how is the CPUC prioritizing projects that leverage middle mile efforts and connect underserved tribal um, communities? Karen, why don't I go right to you for that uh, more detailed question? Yeah, thank you very much for that one. Um, the purpose of the middle mile is to enable the last mile connections. That's how the legislation was, was initially put together. And um, uh, it, you know, it can't go everywhere at one time, but they are inextricably linked. And so I think the strategy is 
um, from the um, from the CBT Golden State perspective to have the 10,000 miles um, availability of it. And from our perspective, from the last mile is to work with our priority areas and then later tranches of funding to be able to get to the point where where everything is connected. Feel free to follow up if that's not enough of an answer for you. Perfect. Thank you, Karen. Um, and one, um, an additional, um, so uh, additional question is just, uh, is there a match for the grant? And um, so, yeah, so we've got Carla Rodriguez is asking, is there a match for the grant? Um, is there a match for the grant? So um, many tribes have um, applied for NTIA tribal connectivity funding. Um, and um, at the same time, uh, Rachel talked about our local agency technical assistance and our tribal technical assistance, where we try to get a consultant to help you figure out how these things can be put together. Um, so we do not provide quote unquote matching funds, but many of our programs essentially fund all of the work that you need to do to be able to get to the, the place that you want to be. Karen, I think the question was maybe more, does the tribe, is the tribe required to provide a match to the grant? Oh, like, um, yeah. Uh, so from the federal funding account, no. No, I mean, I'm from your, so like if, if the LATA funding was granted to the tribe, let's say in the amount of $200,000, would the tribe have to pony up any of their own money to match it is, is probably the question. Thank you for clarifying that. And the answer is no, you would not. Thank you, Karen. Um, and I'm I'm appreciate all the questions that have been asked. I'm I'm looking give. Um, uh, let's see. Um, are there any other hands? Um, and then I do have one last question on the LATA process and whether that is a closed door session or whether the applicant needs to attend. Uh, you wouldn't need to attend. We do have virtual access to our voting meetings now. It would be public. It is how it is uh, voted on in the public session. Um, so not closed door, um, but also would not be required, is not required to attend in person. Or, or virtually. Thank you. So having, I'm not seeing any other questions, um, but appreciate the questions that we have received this afternoon. Um, I do wanna thank all of our presenters, but I want to express um, appreciation for um, folks who, um, who have, uh, from the tribal governments who joined us this afternoon. There's been a lot of um, contact information. Um, if folks have follow-up questions that you didn't um, think about um, and uh, during today's presentation. Um, so we will be providing, um, we will be sharing and making available the presentation and the recording this afternoon. Um, I'm giving one last look to see if there are um, any additional hands um, and I'm not seeing any. Um, so again, um, appreciate everybody's participation and the information sharing um, and the, you know, the kind of continued conversations that will, that we will have on the Middle Mile Broadband Initiative and the projects and that will be, um, that we will be getting underway and constructing. Um, and I thank everybody. So um, be safe in this weather and um, thank you.